Good afternoon. I will call the policy session of the Phoenix City Council to order for September 22nd and begin with a roll call. Councilman DeCicio. Councilmember Garcia. Here. Councilman Nowakowski. Councilwoman Pastor. Here. Councilwoman Stark. Here. Councilman Waring. Here. Councilwoman Williams. Here. Vice Mayor Guardado. Here. Mayor Gallego. Here. We will begin with council information and follow up requests. Vice Mayor. Um, yes, th thank you so much for that, Mayor. I wanted just to remind everyone that we have a lot of upcoming opportunities for folks who need to get free COVID testing in District 5. This Friday, testing will be at Los Olivos Park from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. On Saturday, we'll have testing, we'll, we'll have testing at Crystal Mall from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. On Monday, the mobile testing van will be at the Fry Supermarket at 19th Avenue in Glendale from 7 a.m. till noon. As always, all the COVID testing times and locations can be found at phoenix.gov slash COVID testing. I also wanted to mention that last week we received a call from Pam Boyd, the president of the local theatrical stage employees union whose members work at the Phoenix Convention Center, the Orpheum Theater, and the Symphony. Like many in the tourism, hospitality, and entertainment industries, their members have really been struggling. I wanted to thank Mitch Machaca and his team for their work in ensuring that many of these employees were able to apply for the latest round of financial relief from the CARES Act Fund through the Arts and Cultural Department. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Councilwoman Pastor. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'm so excited to say about talk about all the stuff that we're doing. Um, I want to thank my high school youth intern. Uh, they've been very active virtually. They've created an online college mentorship program for high school seniors. Uh, this program matches a high school student with a college student from a similar background so that they can learn about college applications where to find scholarships, and how to survive dorm, li dorm living. Uh, the kids are also getting ready to launch the District 4 Youth Instagram to share information and events geared to high school and college students. I also want to talk about my community education and outreach. My office has partnered with Lieutenant Sarah Field from the Sex Crimes Division to assist with outreach and education for victims of sexual assault from some of the most vulnerable communities. Our first brainstorming session is with the LGBTQ community on how to successfully do outreach and education. And then uh, we are testing or doing an organic farming uh, for firefighters. Uh, we are going into the farming business at this moment. Uh, we are working with Agava Farm to install farming gardens. Our first test gardens will be at uh, Fire Station 9 and at Vincere Cancer Center. For the firehouse, we are working with the team deciding on what they want to grow that would be organic, healthy, and help save on some grocery bills. With each month's harvest, we will do a cooking segment on what to do with, with what vegetables are grown. Um, I also want to talk about the COVID testing. On October 10th, we are partnering with the owners of Linwood Apartments at 53rd Avenue and McDowell. The apartment owners are great community activists and are planning a carnival type atmosphere to encourage everyone to come out and get tested. In addition to our COVID testing, the van will also be uh, working or trying, I guess uh, I found out some federal law today, but we are trying to get flu shots done. We are hoping to set a new record in how many people uh, can get tested in one day. That is it, thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman. I also have a few mentions myself. 
today is the first day of fall and so we we hope to see some cooler weather coming up we are also marking rosh hashanah and the jewish new year which is a holiday where you can reflect on the year of past and also move forward with a renewed spirit i think we are it's fair to say we are all ready for a new year so i, I hope the new year brings you good luck even if it is is not your faith we are also celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month right now, and the amazing contributions our Hispanic community, more than 500,000 strong, has made to our city. It is certainly fitting that we will recognize and uh, have a discussion on the Latino Cultural Center at today's meeting, and I wanna thank all of our council members, but particularly our Latino council members who've been working on that. I uh, also want to congratulate Phoenix College on their 100 year anniversary and, and please Councilman Pastor pass on our thoughts to the community. It is a, a huge milestone and uh, just this weekend that uh, one of the big national papers wrote an article about how our community colleges are going to help us recover from COVID-19 and certainly the case here. Today is also National Voter Registration Day and I want to encourage everyone to make sure their voter registration is current, you have until October 5th. The National Civic Center has done a study and looked at Arizona young people, and it turns out uh, among those who turn 18 within a few months of election, the majority yet they found are not yet registered. If you turn 18 between now and the election, you are eligible to vote. And so I would encourage if you know any young people in your life or anyone in general, Today's a great day to register to, to vote. I also wanna offer my sincere congratulations to Katherine Sorensen. Today is our last policy meeting before she retires from the city. I have had the fortune of working with Katherine since before I joined the city council and she is known nationally as a major expert in water policy. She's moved us to be a more sustainable city, better prepared or the drought, which is so important and vital to the future of a desert community like our own. We will certainly miss her expertise, but are grateful for her service to the city of Phoenix and, and wish her the best. Uh, any additional council comments? Councilwoman Williams. Thank you, Mayor. I too wanna to wish Catherine the very best. She has been exceptionally good. She is nationally renowned for her expertise in her leadership. But I'll tell you one thing I think is really special about Catherine. She's always been very modest about her skills and what she's been doing. And she always says, it's because I have good employees. And I know she's strongly behind them at all times. I also want to take a moment to recognize Deb Ostriker, who's also going to be retiring soon. Deb has led the international efforts for direct flights from Europe and Asia, well, from everywhere internationally. She is another one that's nationally known and respected, and I want to wish her well, along with Jim Bennett, who we all know is one of the best in the entire world on aviation issues. Just great, and we're going to miss all three of them greatly. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. I understand Jim is with us till November, so we will continue to celebrate the departures and, and recognize great service to the community. Um, certainly with Devo Stryker and, and Jim Bennett, uh, we are losing people who have, have helped build our modern airport. Any additional comments before we move on? All right. Well, a busy time at the city of Phoenix and in all the council offices. We are also working very hard to respond to the coronavirus, and that is our next topic. Well, we'll turn it over to our city manager, Ed Zerker. Thank you, Mayor and members of the council. We're pleased today to provide an update uh, on the coronavirus relief fund allocations for, for public programs. The city council, I think, deserves significant recognition for adopting an early, early on, adopting a strategic allocation plan and your adoption of that plan has allowed staff to really focus on executing it over the summer. And I just would encourage council members to pause for a moment and consider what your work has made possible for the community, and I think it's very significant. You shaped a program that has literally saved lives through heat relief, rent relief, 
utility payments, COVID testing, small business and micro enterprise assistance, PPE for schools, connecting uh, families to education, and connecting seniors to companionship. All that has been possible, and it's been because of the work you did, the plan you laid out, and it's actually been very satisfying for our staff to be able to implement that. You made it clear to us that the money had to get out to the community, and we've responded. The staff and the contracted providers have worked hard to get the money to those who need it the most. And in the case of the rent mortgage utility assistance programs, even the Arizona Republic has reported that the city has put more money into the hands of our community so far than the state of Arizona. So as we move towards spending, the spending deadline imposed by the federal government of December 30th of this year, we're examining how we need to adjust that spending to meet needs. And so over the next three weeks, from what you'll hear today, we wanna to work with council members to identify the best places for unspent funds to be most effective. And we've learned a lot in these first three months of implementation, as, and we look forward to talking with you more about that. So now I'll turn the presentation over to Jeff Barton, our Deputy City Manager, who's leading the staff implementation and the auditing team. And then also recognize that behind the scenes, we have a financial team who has uh, submitted the first two required financial reports to the federal government. They actually got them in three days early, so I wanna commend them for that hard work as we're learning as we go uh, what it takes to, to meet the federal reporting requirements that are, that are ever changing. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff Barton. Thank you, Ed. Mayor, members of the council, We'll start today's presentation with the slide that you've seen numerous times since May 5th, the date that you had ultimately adopted our coronavirus relief fund stat or strategy and allocation. Um, again, this just to reorient you, you gave us direct um, direction as well as um, guidance in terms of how you wanted this program structured. And so what you see before you is that plan that allocated that $293 million across three primary areas, community investment, city operations, and initially it was a reserve to preserve, but on June 30th, you gave us direction to use the $143 million reserve to offset our public safety salaries, and by doing that, we avoided having to make general fund program reductions and employee compensation changes. Um, so what we're gonna spend our time talking to you today about is the $75 million in community investment. And again, just to reorient you to some of the programs and services that we're providing under that area, we've got our Small Business Assistance Loan Program, our Micro Enterprise Arts Assistance Program, our Residential and Commercial Utility Assistance Program, our Residential Rental Mortgage Program, Eviction Prevention, Food Delivery, and that's just to name a few. We'll go into more detail as I walk you through this. The goal of today's presentation is really to give you an, an idea, an update on where we are, what we've spent, what we've delivered, and what we've accomplished since you adopted this program. And I can tell you, to, to Ed's point, not only are we doing more than what the state has done, I can tell you based on the conversations and calls that Denise, the CFO, Olson, and I sit on um, weekly with GFOA and a number of other entities, the city of Phoenix has done more and accomplished more with coronavirus relief fund than pretty much any other city in the country. And that's largely a testament to the work that you've done and the direction that you've provided staff. So I wanna thank you and, and give you praise for that, for that commitment. So we're gonna start first in business assistance. Under that program, we allocated essentially $15.7 million. The first program is our Small Business Relief Fund program. Under that program, you allocated $5 million for Chris Mackey and, and the Community Economic Development Department to work with our small businesses. And now this program allocates essentially $10,000 grants to business in or adjacent to low um, income census tracts. They get up to, again, $10,000, but these companies have to have 25 or fewer employees. To date, we've spent 2.4 million of that $5 million, and therefore um, 225 companies have been funded with this program. So again, a lot of work has gone into this, and again, I think the, the results show in the numbers in terms of what we've approved. Micro uh, Business Resiliency Grant, this was another program under CED where $6 million of our CRF was allocated. To date, we've spent 4.9 million, so there's $1.1 million uh, remaining under this program, and 1,200 companies have been funded. Under this program, this is again for smaller businesses with five or fewer employees, and they have an opportunity to get $5,000 grants. 
our next area is our restaurant restart program. This was a $1 million program, um, and we've spent entirely all of that funding. 103 companies have been funded to date with that $1 million allocation. Also, um, some of you mentioned Mr. Manchaka and his work um, earlier in your comments. Um, Arts and Culture Assistance Program, you allocated $2.6 million, and to date, $2.3 million has been awarded. That funded 272 artists and 68 organizations. The balance of, of this program is expected to be released over the next few weeks as Mitch and his staff review the final proposals that came in during this last round of applications. Um, next, our Small Business Concessionaires Grant Program, and so this was a $1 million program. We've spent all of that program, it is fully funded, and 18 concessionaires were funded. Um, small Business Expertise and Guidance. This was a $100,000 allocation. To date, nothing has been spent, but um, Chris Mackey and her, and her team are working diligently with vendors to secure a platform that will enable our businesses to work more diligently in COVID, um, the COVID arena, as well as working with the city. So we, we expect to have this guidance propped up. It's more than likely gonna be a digital library, um, and that will be um, up and running before the end of the fiscal year or before the end of the calendar year, sorry. December 30th is our deadline. Next, we move over into our utility rent and mortgage assistance program. And under this, you made two large allocations. One was a $30 million or a $24 million allocation to residential utility rent and mortgage assistance program. You allocated $24 million of the $30 million here. We, on the front end, gave Wildfire, who's kind of serving as our quarterback, uh, to the nonprofits that are working under them to certify and dispense this money. We awarded them half of those funds, $12 million up front. To date, about 1,831 households have been funded through this program. Um, I can tell you also that as of last week's report, we are close to $8 million of that 12 actually being um, expensed. And so we know also that working with those nonprofits based on information and conversations with Wildfire and the conversations I've had with Spencer Self, um, our neighborhood services director, we know that many of the entities that are serving in the capacity of doling out this money, they have enough applications to satisfy their $2 million allotment. And so we really expect this program to pick up. Again, we really went live late in July, and since then we've already allocated about $8 million. So again, I think we have no concerns here of this money being allocated by, by the end of the year. The next area is our commercial city services assistance program. Um, this was really designed to help businesses with their city services bill. Yeah, you allocated about $6 million here. And as you can see, we've spent or allocated only about 150,000. And with that, 143 commercial accounts were funded. What we're finding with this program, as I mentioned to many of you during your briefings, we're finding that a lot of our commercial businesses, they themselves do not have utility um, city services bills because they are a tenant in a space and they pay their city services bill probably in, in their total of their rent that they're paying monthly. So this is an area where we would probably come back to you next month with an idea as we would like to reprioritize or repurpose these funds because they're just not gonna move um, quickly enough to get out by December 30. Uh, the next, we move on to distance learning and Wi-Fi access. Under this program, you allocated about $3.3 million. Um, w first was um, an allocation of $590,000 to f um, add public Wi-Fi facilities and, and uh, equipment in our public facilities. We've spent about $520,000 of that $590,000. 43 of our sites have been activated, and there are 52 total, so we've got about nine remaining. Those nine sites are currently in design, and equipment is being ordered, and again, there will be no problem getting this money allocated and fully spent by December 30. Next up, uh, tablets for housing residents. This was one that, if you recall, I, I got really excited about because I mentioned to you, I, I grew up as a, as a kid in public housing, so this really excited me, especially knowing that many of those students don't have the resources they need to actually pursue and matriculate in school. You allocated $660,000. That was for housing to procure 800 tablets. To date, 739 of those tablets have been um, brought in and distributed to our, our families. And within the next couple of weeks, probably by the end of this month, all of those tablets will be awarded. Uh, next up, bridging the digital divide. This was something that Councilwoman Pastor was, was very passionate about. 
Um, that was a $2 million allocation to really look at boosting the city's footprint as well as other entities that could boost their footprint for free Wi-Fi access to, again, allow our residents and our citizens and, and specifically our kids really get the resources they need to matriculate during the time of COVID and during the time of the pandemic. So that is a combination of working with CED is leading this effort with, with Councilwoman Pastor, um, working with the Phoenix College, Maricopa County, as well as GPEC. And again, I think based on some information that I received today, I, I think we're in a good place to possibly get this money out the door by, by December 30. Uh, next up, we move to mitigation and care for vulnerable populations. Um, this was a $10 million allocation specifically aimed at seniors, domestic violence, as, as well as a number of other things. Uh, the first area we'll talk about is refugee and asylee uh, seekers utility rent and mortgage assistance program. You allocated $1.7 million to this program. And again, just like the residential side, we only gave Wildfire half of the money up front. They had to earn the rest, essentially. But to date, 134 households have been funded. We know that there are additional applications in the approval process. And again, we, we feel very confident that this money will be out the door by December 30 as well. Next up is our refugee relief grants. Um, $1 million was allocated here. And this is one that Spencer and his team have really just worked. The contracts will be executed and finalized this month. There are about 18 entities that are um, set up to deliver about 21 different grant type programs. Um, again, just based on the nature of the, the program and based on the, the, you know, the level of support that these entities get, this may be an area that we would have to revisit these funds getting out by the end of the fiscal year. Or I keep saying fiscal year, I'm so tied to that. December 30 of, of this calendar year. Uh, next up, refugee microenterprise grants. So we, you allocated 300,000 here, $56,000 has been awarded to date. That covered 12 applications and based on information from Spencer and his team, 32 of those ad additional applications are currently in the review process. And then we allocated for domestic violence. We worked with a number of different um, uh, nonprofits to deliver services and to provide support and equipment and PPE and other types of materials that they need to deliver um, their services to, to their support group. So one million, just a little over a million dollars was allocated to them. All of those funds have been committed, contracts executed, and the services are, are being provided as we speak. Human trafficking was another area. I know this was something that Councilman Waring has been very passionate about ever since he actually stepped into the city council role. Um, so $310,000 was allocated there, $56,000 has gone out the door to date, and that covered some materials, some pl supplies, which would p were PPE, as well as some other sanitizing and, uh, materials. But we also know there were also additional services that are going to be provided, and again, we expect no issue, no challenges with, with that money getting out by, by December 30. Landlord tenant assistance, this was again working with the community legal um, services program and so a million one was allocated, a million dollars has been committed. To date 61 households have uh, received services um, and those attorneys are working with our residents to help them with the eviction process and to help them uh, avoid that, that situation. And so again, that money is out the door, residents are receiving services. Heat relief. This was this is one of the crowning jewels. I, I think um, we we've gotten a lot of um, fanfare and a lot of publicity on our heat relief efforts at the convention center. So this is our heat respite center. Um, included in this eight hundred and seventy thousand dollar allocation was five hundred thousand dollars to run that from the last couple of days of May through the end of July. Since that time, you the council have directed us to extend that to the end of this year of this calendar month. September, so that will end this month. To cover that, we know we're going to need about another $300,000. Um, to date, we've spent about $666,000. I hate putting those three sixes together, but that, that's what the number is. Um, but what we've provided, we've served over almost 23,000 individuals, 40,000 meals, and 329,000 bottles of water have been delivered. Next up, our senior assistance program. So this was largely, um, it was about designing and, and rehabbing and retrofitting our senior centers so that we can bring our seniors back into um, the center safely um, while COVID was going on. So that's, Public Works is leading that. They're doing some assessments, working with human services 
to ensure that our, our seniors can come back safely into those facilities. This also included a contract with the Area Agency on Aging for about $700,000. That contract's been executed and, and they are receiving services. I can tell you that based on my knowledge of what was being planned for some of these facilities, again, there are some instances of plexiglass, social distancing, but also some new technology. For example, making sure that our classrooms, so that you have proper social distancing, they're talking about adding digital equipment so that classes can be um, broadcast um, you know, from one room to other rooms and you can spread out the seniors and they can all attend their classes without interruption. There's there's also discussion and, and plans for us to actually allocate tablets and so that seniors can have tablets and, and check tablets out and take them home so they can do everything from their you know telemedicine and to just you know communicating with family and friends remotely so that that is underway and again we think those dollars will be spent by the end of the year next we move on to food delivery this was a five million dollar program um, the first part was a partnership with a variety of nonprofits. Um, we allocated $3 million there, and that's everything from the Arizona Food Bank to St. Vincent de Paul's to St. Mary's, as well as the Salvation Army. And I can tell you that as, of, as we speak, food distribution is underway with all four groups. Some groups have specific plans to target specific areas, like for example, the Salvation Army, they are targeting Maryvale. And then we also have, under the city side, $300,000 was administered, is being administered through the Human Services Department. Uh, they've spent about $175,000 since March in this program, and with that, they've delivered over 20,000 congregate meals to our seniors. Food delivery continues. We also had a million seven allocation that was being overseen by the Office of Environmental Programs. To date, $1.1 million have been spent. This program is really broken down into three components. The first component is our Feed Phoenix program, and to date, that's where most of those actuals are, that the actual dollars spent. We've delivered almost 16,000 meals and over almost 1,200 community-supported agricultural boxes. The next two areas, funds to feed Phoenix and funds for schools, these dollars will be spent and these, these meals will be delivered over the next two weeks. So the funds to feed Phoenix program will deliver 165,000 meals to over 7,000 families and 17,000 individuals. Under the funds for schools program, 294,000 meals will be provided to four school districts um, that actually competed in a grant process. Under better health and community outcomes, we had $5 million allocated. The first area was $500,000 to purchase and procure 1.2 million masks. To date, 200,000 of those masks have been distributed. You, each council district, got several of those, several thousands of those masks, and I know you are distributing them. These masks will also come in handy as we, as we start to talk to you about our reopening philosophy. Um, community testing events, initially $1 million was allocated here. Um, we've spent year to date about $700,000 and we've tested over 28,000 individuals. We know also here based on what we know is coming and what we plan to test between now and December 30, this program will require an additional $600,000 as well. Also under, community, under better health and community outcomes, we procured two and a half million dollars worth of PPE for schools. Again, this is everything from PPE to sanitizer to face shields to you, you, gowns and you name it. Those supplies are currently being distributed and, and underway. We also, you as a council directed us to allocate about $700,000 to health connectors. This is to ensure that those that need assistance connecting with proper health care have the resources to do so. Um, to do that, we issued an RFQ. That deadline was Friday, um, no, uh, September 18th. Um, and so um, evaluation of that um, submittal is actually underway as we speak. So next month we'll be able to provide you with some additional information on that program. You also were very concerned about your City of Phoenix family, your City of Phoenix employees. And under that you allocated $300,000 of additional resources for the Employee Hope Fund. And under that we are able to help employees specifically with rent, utility, mortgage assistance, but also to help them with funeral expenses from family members who pass away as a result of COVID. At the time of this report, $98,000 was, was awarded and that served about 29 families. I can tell you that as of Friday afternoon, Tony instructed me that that number is now about $109,000. So again, this is serving our, 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 our Phoenix family well. 
And then finally, you as the council, we did set some money aside, unallocated, about $6 million. That remains completely intact. And, and again, it is there at your disposal. Um, and so what we would like to do is to talk to you at the end of this presentation about some next steps. Um, so what I want to do is summarize for you again where we are. So as you can see, business assistance, 15.7 million allocated, and we've spent 11.5. Utility assistance, $30 million allocated, 12.2 spent. Distance learning and Wi-Fi access, 3.3 million allocated, 1 million spent. Mitigation and care for vulnerable populations, $10 million allocated, 4.5 spent. Food delivery, 5 million, 4.2 spent. Better health and community testing, 5 million, 3.8 spent. The unallocated portion remains untouched at $6 million. And so you can see the $75 million that was originally allocated, 37.2 spent, which leaves about 37.8 million to spend between now and December 30. So we are about 50% expended. I also want to take a few moments to walk you through some of our compliance and transparency, our commitment to those, those two initiatives. Um, so to ensure compliance with the federal guidelines, both from Treasury as well as the Office of Inspector General, who will come in at the end of this process to evaluate our compliance and adherence to federal guidelines, we enlisted a team of audit and budget and research and neighborhood services staff to ensure that we are, that our vendors and our nonprofit agencies that are at helping us deliver these services are following federal guidelines as well as city guidelines. And to accomplish that, we are selecting samples from vendors such as Wildfire. We are reaching out to them on a regular basis and getting uh, random samples of the, uh, the files and the families that have received services from their, their particular nonprofits and making sure that all the documentation is there. The purpose of this is to be able to correct any deficiencies that we see real time rather than waiting till the end and having a finding from either the Treasury or the Office of Inspector General. The other thing, as Ed mentioned, our finance department, CFO Denise Olson, Joe Jaskowitz, and, and, and staff are very busy uh, following the quarterly reporting requirements of the Office of Treasury. We had a report due on Monday, September 21st, and so we'll continue to do that um, as required. The other thing that we've done is we did stand up a website, which is www.phoenix.gov forward slash COVID relief. This, um, if you were to click on this website, it takes you directly to our COVID website, which highlights all of the allocations and programs that you did and administered under the Coronavirus Relief Fund. It also provides information and links to the vendors that are um, approving and apply, uh, um, uh, approving the different programs and administering those programs. Um, what I am working on now is trying to establish a dashboard so some of this data that I'm talking to you about today can be also visible on that web page. So again, that's our commitment to transparency, that's our commitment to compliance. The next step, so what I would like to talk to you to about now, just for a couple of moments, as, as Ed mentioned, December 30th is the date that this money has to be spent or returned to the Fed. So that's a little over, that's basically 99 days from today. So what I would really like for you to do is to take the next couple of, of days and we'll come back to you next month. But again, I would like to come back to you next month to talk to you about reallocating the CRF funds that exist in community investment and city operations programs that may not be expended by the deadline. Um, and so I can tell you that just based off the top of my head, some of the areas that we would look at um, are, are those that I mentioned in this presentation, which would include Commercial City Services Assistance Program, the Bridging the Digital Divide, I think we kind of got to a resolution on that this morning, so I, I believe that money actually may make it out the door by December 30th based on the conversations we had today. Our refugee relief grants, as I've, as, as I've discussed, the healthcare connectors, we may not spend all that was allocated there based on some of the submittals that come in, the unallocated portion, and then on the city operations side, we know that we allocated about $19 million for payroll expense reimbursement. We may not need all of that. I do anticipate using some of that funding to offset some of those other increases that we talked about, such as to the respite center, as well as our increased testing costs. Um, there's also some additional expenses that we're going to be bringing forward to you in a couple of weeks. 
um, such as um, another program where we would like to give seniors in, um, in public housing facilities tablets as well, just like we did the kids, so that they can keep up on their telemedicine appointments and other things. We also would like to allocate some tablets to our youth and education department so that they can continue their tutoring programs as well as other mentoring programs in this COVID um, arena. So we would take some of that out of the city operations side. So I would like to take the next couple of weeks to reforecast my net to see how much money we're going to have available in not just the community investment side, but also on the city operations side. So we'd come back to you next month with, with an idea of what those dollars look like. So what we ask of you today is really just kind of think about where you'd like to see some additional funding go. And it, I would suggest that it would have to be in areas that we could get the money out quick because come you know, next month, we're a little over two months away from our December 30th deadline. Um, and so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about the Coronavirus Relief Fund. Mayor. Well, thank you, Jeff. We really appreciate the expertise you have developed in coronavirus relief. And thank you to all of our city employees who've gotten out there uh, to make sure we are serving our community as best during this difficult time. It really has been inspiring to see our employees at work many of whom are doing things they didn't expect to, but are true public servants and, and have been willing to help us. I will start with Councilwoman Stark and then go to Councilwoman Pastor for an update on whatever she wants, but I hope the digital divide breaking news we would love to hear. <laughs> Councilwoman Stark, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Uh, first off, I wanna thank staff. They have done a tremendous job in such limited time and I am so impressed by every department that has been a part of this and especially Jeff. Thank, thank you Jeff for all you've done. Um, I, I do appreciate um, wanting some time. I, I want to think about this. One of the things I wonder about is in our assistance for utilities we targeted low, in, low and moderate income census tracts. However, I know of some projects, such as one is in the Moon Valley area, that probably doesn't qualify for a low income census tract, but they actually have housing set aside for seniors, low and moderate income seniors, and I would like to find a way to help them out. So if we could maybe meet Jeff and talk about that, I think that's definitely a, a, a sector in need. So. But again, everything you've done, just wonderful. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mayor. Thank you, Councilwoman. Councilwoman Pestor. So, good afternoon. Um, I wanted to discuss the digital divide uh, because I think there's um, misunderstanding, not misunderstanding, but just talking about the digital divide. Uh, and it's more of, I need my colleagues, or have my colleagues have an understanding of what is happening. Uh, we are working with 17 to 18 partners at this moment to solve uh, the digital divide. And uh, what had happened is in May, because I had been hearing it from not only the city, but I also heard it from the community colleges, and then I heard it from uh, the school districts, the 14, there's really 15 uh, urban school districts that feed into Phoenix Union. And so I put some experts together in May to start solving, I guess, the digital divide uh, problem. And what it includes is the public and private sectors too, because uh, GPEC is involved in this dialogue and discussion of how we'll then we'll bring in the future, uh, the workforce of the future into play and so, um, and businesses to assist. So it's really long-term solutions, really long-term solutions with the fast and furious timeline of December 30th, 30th 31st, uh, and, and being able to uh, solve this problem. Um, what I can say is the, the, if we are able to, to prove it, and right now we're, uh, we're doing a test, a beta test at this moment, uh, around the city to see if what we think are, or what the solutions are are going to work in our city. Uh, we're testing it right now. And then what we're gonna do is move it into uh, neighborhoods. Uh, we'll be moving it 
we'll be testing it with Alhambra uh, Elementary School and uh, Cartwright Elementary School along with city facilities uh, to hold uh, some of the equipment that is needed. So it's really infrastructure working off of the city and the schools uh, already built infrastructure and expanding it out to the community. We've done a, and, and, and October 27th is really where we're gonna show you where we started and how we ended or where we're gonna end. Uh, but I just wanna let my colleagues know uh, we're, we're working fast and furious. There's many different phases to it. It's the first phase of the test. The second phase will be moving to uh, North Phoenix because we know that North Phoenix is not as dense. And uh, there's a lot more, uh, there's pockets of areas that infrastructure needs to go into, but it's not uh, like the west side, the south side and Levine. Um, and it will, we are testing it because there's, there's spots in our city in particular where our trailer homes are that are, uh, it's difficult to get uh, Wi-Fi in there. Levine around the corner, uh, around the 202, around the mountain, we have a big dead spot. So we're working with all our community partners in, uh, in order to solve that. We're hoping that it will, uh, by October 27th, you'll see the timeline, the plan, and the cost. As I'm speaking right now, there are four committees going all simultaneously. Uh, there's a technical uh, committee, there's an IGA committee, there's a procurement committee, and uh, we're right now beta testing as we speak. It's going up right now. So there's lots of things happening. I just haven't talked about it because I've been uh, working with everybody to try, to try to get it up. So October 27th is when you really will see uh, where the money is going with the digital divide. Thank you. Thank you, Councilwoman Pastor. We appreciate your hard work. Uh, we are all wanting to close the digital divide and, and thank you. Um, I know Councilmember Garcia has worked on that as well and we'll turn to him. Thank you, Mayor. And, and yes, thank you, Councilwoman Pastor. I think that's, if you're able to figure that out and we could put some extra money towards the end of the year to make it expand more, I think that would be a great idea. I wanna, you know, like everyone else, thank Jeff, thanks to the staff, Ed, everyone for making this happen. When we put this together, we had no idea how COVID was gonna impact our community. We had a sense and we had some thoughts and I think we were able to make some, some good educated guesses and, and, and had some success with some of those programs. So I hope with the successful programs as we move forward, It'd be easier to add to those rather than trying to reinvent things. A couple of the, of areas that I think we we didn't know how it was going to turn out, um, or we didn't, I guess we weren't able to perceive, is some of the issues with youth. I think we're we're seeing that a lot of youth ended up without having anything to do, and so I think support for youth programs that leads into um, some some creating jobs is something that I think we could do right now towards the end. Having seen all the people laid off from the airport, from American Airlines, from different companies, I think we have to, uh, as a city now, come together and support all those people that have lost jobs. I know we're supporting with, with utility assistance and we're supporting um, with, with some of the other uh, things they may need, with food and all that, even with eviction prevention. But I think if we can, use the, 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 some of this money towards the end to get people back to work and, and either you know fund some more of the programs that we have or come up with another program, that would be great. And so looking forward to that, that next conversation of where it makes more sense. Um, but I do think uh, looking into jobs, looking into workers and, and specifically the people who've lost their jobs, some might have to do career changes. And so supporting training centers, supporting um, more jobs is, is, I think, a place we need to go. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Council Member. Vice Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, once again, again, thank you so much, Jeff, for all the work that you and the staff have been doing. It's been, it's been pretty amazing and remarkable. Um, you guys are working um, 
all the work that you guys had to do and it was very diverse and it was, you know, sometimes um, difficult and comprehensive. So thank you so much for the work that you guys did. I'm looking forward, obviously, like I have a ton of ideas and looking forward to meeting with you and talking to you about how is it that we continue to support our community, all, one, all vulnerable populations, our seniors, our workers, as Council Member, Men, Council Member Garcia mentioned, are now out of work and need to start a new career. We have a lot of people that are need to start a new career, need to start a new path, and let's hope um, that we can bring something great to 2021 and that 2020 was just one big nightmare and that we're able to help people start start in the right direction in 2021. So, so yes, yeah, so thank you so much for all that you guys do. We're very excited. Glad to see that we were number one in terms of getting the, the money out and in the way that we did. So that's exciting, but that we, we were only able to do that with the support and with the help of all of you guys. So thank you so much. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Vice Mayor. Any additional council comments? Yeah. Mayor? Councilman DeCicio. Oh, thank you, Mayor. So Jeff, um, one of the things, I looked at the sales numbers that came in, the revenue numbers um, from you know, sales in the city, and they were up considerably, up about 20%. Where are we with the budget as it stands right now without the 143 million in it? And then if we add the 143 million, where are we? Councilman Waring, or Councilman DeCicio, sorry, Mayor, members of the Council, that's an excellent question, Councilman. I, we will be coming back to you on October 13th to give you a very detailed um, general fund status of how we ended last fiscal year and what our fund balances look like. Um, to your point, the two-month revenue report did just come out. Um, we issued it today. Um, that two-month revenue report showed that our general fund collections are up about 9.5% over last fiscal year. Um, now, part of that 9.5% increase is largely driven by an audit adjustment, so when you take that out, it's about 6.5%. Mm -hmm. Now, even, even with that being said, Councilman, um, there are some things that, again, you know, we, we've gotten very adept at analyzing our revenues um, over the years using our econometric tools and all the other little tricks that we've, that we've learned to develop. Um, what I can tell you is that right now at this stage, it's a little bit too early for me to say where we are financially. And there are a variety of reasons for that. Number one, um, we really don't know what our sales tax is telling us at this point in time. Uh, the 6.5% that I, that I mentioned earlier is 6.5% over this time last year. That's almost an apples to oranges comparison because this time last year we did not have online sales and now we do. So it's comparing an, a period in time when we didn't have online sales to when we do. Um, and I can tell you that looking at the city side of things as well as the state side, online sales is about seven to eight percent of that total sales tax collections on retail anyway. And so that's about $13 million across those two, city and state. So that, that's something that we've got to continue to look at. The other thing is you and I have had conversations as well the, the state of the economy right now is also driven by a variety of things that, that are making money shift and people's spending patterns shift. And, and what I mean by that, some folks did get and are getting uh, pandemic unemployment insurance, and so that's propping up their ability to spend and have you know, um, excess cash to spend on projects. The other thing that we know, a lot of folks are working from home, teleworking, so they're not spending money on gas. We also have families that don't have to spend money on daycare because their children are at home right now. So that's also being shifted from one area to the next. Um, so again, what I, what I would ask of you is right now, I would say it's too early for me to tell you where we are. I, do, I can tell you that we are outperforming our worst case scenario, which is what we kind of predicated our budget on uh, for this fiscal year, which is a good thing. Um, and you know, again, I, I think, this is definitely unlike the last recession that we went through, um, and we do appear to have pretty solid growth moving forward. Um, but again, I, I want a couple more months to really see what happens when the pandemic unemployment assurance is no longer uh, in the mix of activity. I wanna see what things look like after people return back to work, and I wanna see what the impacts are on the overall economy. So I, I know that's a long-winded answer, but the reality is I just <laughs> truly don't know right now. I, I will tell you that our fund balance is going to be higher than we expected. 
largely because of that $143 million transfer to offset public safety salaries um, from the coronavirus relief fund. But again, that is one-time money. And so if our revenues do not compensate for that one-time money going away in fiscal years 21-22 or 22-23, that's what we're really looking ahead for, um, for right now. Um, so hopefully that kind of answers your question, um, but if it doesn't, please let me know. No, that is why you are so good at what you do. I, I swear to you, you are amazing because you're taking a cautious approach to this, as you should. I mean, at least the numbers I'm looking at right now gives me a lot of optimism, but you're doing everything the way you're supposed to be doing it, Jeff. Congrats. I mean, you're amazing for doing that. Your answer was perfect. That's exactly what it is. But I think what we're going to end up finding, this is just my guess, just looking at the last two months of sales numbers, because that was when we really got hit under the COVID, is we're going to find that there has been a lot of balancing going on in the economy, a lot of it. But the sales numbers, the revenue numbers, all those things are going to show for a strong city. I mean, realistically, we're going to show growth when we, sh we were looking at a negative situation here. We're looking at something that just didn't have the kind of impact that we expected. But we did it all right, and you did it right, by providing that type of caution that we needed because everyone was afraid at the time. No one knew exactly what was going to happen, and we still don't. So long term, I think we've got – you know, a good thing going in front of us. But we also have a big wall hitting us in the next couple of years. And you and I have talked about this, Jeff. It's the pension growth. And that is going to hit us harder, I believe, than this whole COVID thing. So if you want to talk a little bit about that wall coming in front of us. Uh, Councilman uh, DeCicio, Mayor, members of the council, we, you know, in, in conversations with you, as well as my boss, the city manager, we will be having pretty robust conversations at our future budget conversations with you about pension. Um, what I can tell you, as you well know, because I'm sure you all manage and look at your own stock market portfolios or 401 portfolios, and you see the number that um, COVID and the changes in the economy have done on those portfolios. Um, I know that the, the, um, the pension systems are currently being evaluated by the actuaries. And so I can tell you that the losses that we took in fiscal year 1920, they will find their way into the 2021 rates. So we have that. But we also, uh, ahead of that, uh, the PSPRS board, the Public Safety Pension Retirement Board, they also made some actuarial changes um, that will hit us in fiscal year 22-23. And so again, I think when we move forward in our budget development process, one of the conversations that I myself and the new budget and research director, Amber Williamson, will be having with you are giving you some idea of what those future increases to pension are going to be. And I think so, in some instances, they will be very significant. And so where we do have the opportunity to have one-time monies propping up our fund balance, it would be wise to set some of those funds aside to pay for those future um, anticipated pension increases. Um, that way, we're using one-time money to offset that cost, and we give ourselves a better glide path and would not possibly have to make future cuts to deal with those increased pension um, costs that may be coming down the line. And thank you, Jeff, for that. So what we're going to be looking at, this is just my guess moving forward, just looking at these revenue numbers, which I found very encouraging, and everything else that's been happening in our economy, I found that encouraging, and I think there's a lot of other reasons for it, too. One, we have just an incredible amount of growth, and the growth that we're having right now is not the speculative type of growth that we saw in past years. These are actual bodies moving here, and those actual bodies do buy things. You know, with, you know, we may not be using as much gas, but you know, you have more people using gas, you're gonna end up using the same amount, if not more. So at the end of the day, the amount of growth that we have here, it, it, you know, it, it's very indicative of our economy here in the state of Arizona, which is doing quite well. So we're going, I, you know, this is just my guess. We're going to look at, you know, we're going to be seeing something positive. But so if we do end up having a large sum of money, and I think, and this is for the rest of the council, we're going to be wanting to spend this on reoccurring income, uh, reoccurring expenses. I would strongly encourage us to really think that thing through because these are one-time monies. Just because we're in a growth pattern doesn't mean it's always going to be like this. Um, you know, there are a lot of, situations in the past where people have had great years and all of a sudden they dried up because they didn't do enough saving 
moving, you know, they didn't save enough for the bad years that will come because our cycles are like that in this economy. So these one-time monies are going to be important. And one of the things you might want to think about doing in the future, and that would come to us probably sometime next year is my guess, is literally putting together a plan to pay down our pension debt. And because once you pay that down, it may be 50, maybe 100 million, maybe whatever, you pay down that debt, then what that does is it creates future stability. The pension, you know, whether it's Arizona or anywhere around the nation, they're based off of not real numbers. They expect a rate of return of 7.4%. That's just not real. It did happen this year. One time in 10 years does not make it a standard there. So we're going to be facing very fluctuating markets in the future, and I would strongly encourage whatever monies we have left over, we put it into these one-time things and these expenses that literally drive the cost down and does give you long-term monies that you can then spend on new programs and things like that. It's just not going to be as much as you want right off the bat, but you can plan ahead. Uh, the other thing, Ed, and this is more to you, we're having major issues because we're just not back to work yet. <laughs> you know, the city is still lagging a bit uh, when it comes to other businesses that are out there. Now, everybody's still lagging. There's still a lag in the economy. But we have got to get our place, we've got to get our city open. We've got to be able to provide those services. And, you know, there isn't a day that doesn't go by that people are trying to get things going and get things done. They're dependent upon the city of Phoenix but we're just not all together there yet. So whatever that plan is, Ed, I'd sure like to see it. I'd like to see what we're expecting to move forward on. We've got to open up. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. I'm certainly glad the city has put together tools like our pension stabilization fund to help us move forward and, and prepare for uncertainty in the future. It will also be interesting to see if we have a new revenue source for public safety based on what happens with ballot proposition, um, we could see new funds related to recreational marijuana that would go to public safety and it, uh, public safety pension debt, I think is at the top of this council's priority list for, for those new funds. Um, really appreciate all the, the work staff has been doing and in trying to prepare for what could be um, an unprecedented commitment to get flu shots and then vaccines out in the community and um, appreciate council members including some who've already mentioned that are already working on, on those issues, which I think we need to consider. Um, homelessness and, and finding solutions that provide opportunities for small campuses or facilities with more personalized services remains at the top of, of my personal list for coronavirus relief funds. Um, so have, look forward to the dialogue we're gonna have about where we go from here and, and continued investment in our youth, our older adults, and, and our entire community. Any additional council member comments on this item? We do have one member of the public. All right, we will then go to public comment. Our partner at Justice Center, Wendy Johnson. Hi, good morning, oh, good afternoon, boy, am I off. Um, <laughs> Mayor Gallego and the council, thank you for accepting my request. I wanna thank the council um, and you, Mayor, for the incredible support that you provided to us um, to provide a heat relief shelter through the end of this month for the seniors experiencing homelessness. It has made a remarkable difference. In addition, I wanted to just give a major hallelujah and shout out to the group from, uh, and I just lost my place, I apologize. The, the food program, Feed Phoenix, that has delivered some of the best meals we've had at Justice Center uh, consistently and, and on time and wonderful. Um, we will be concluding our evening meal program at the end of this month due to a lack of funding, but we know that the future for our seniors in homelessness is going to become more 
a greater concern than a growing number. And we are grateful that the city of Phoenix sees homelessness in general and seniors who are 25% of our population um, as a priority. And I thank you for that. And I just really appreciate you uh, taking on this little agency and allowing us to do big things. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Jeff, for that presentation and update, and we'll look forward to continued conversation on this vital community topic. We will next move to the Latino Cultural Center presentation. I want to thank Councilwoman Williams as Mayor Williams for creating the Latino Cultural Center Committee with uh, Councilwoman Mendoza and Councilman Nowakowski. Um, when I joined, I was pleased to appoint the Vice Mayor to join that committee and our, all of our Latino cultural council members and, and entire council have been working so hard on this topic. So excited to introduce Karen Peters, who will introduce everyone providing an update to us. Thank you, Mayor. Good afternoon. Um, we are pleased to be here today to present for your consideration the completed work of the Latino Cultural Center Ad Hoc Committee. I'm joined at the table by Mitch Menchaca, director of the Phoenix Office of Arts and Culture, who uh, together with his staff and representatives of numerous city departments provided staff support to the committee. And Donna Valdez, executive director of Chico Inc., uh, a member of the ad hoc committee and stakeholder participant in the 2017 capital assessment and feasibility study described in your report. As you know, uh, the ad hoc committee was established in February 2019 by Mayor Thelda Williams and expanded by Mayor Gallego in August 2019 with co-chairs, Councilman Nowakowski, former Councilwoman Mendoza, and Vice Mayor Guardado. The committee has worked to chart a path to realize our community's long-held vision for a Phoenix Latino Cultural Center. The ad hoc committee members were appointed from each council district. Before the presentation, I want to thank all of the city staff who were part of this work, staff from the Community and Economic Development Department, Government Relations, Parks and Recreation, Planning and Development, Public Works, Communications, Finance and Real Estate, Human Services, Equal Opportunity, and of course, Arts and Culture truly took a village to, to do this work. And on behalf of all those staff, I want to thank the ad hoc committee members. I can say that we were genuinely inspired by their creativity, thoughtfulness, and deep commitment to this project. To those joining us today remotely, and as well as those who could not, many, many thanks for your service. So I'll turn it over now to Mitch and Donna. Good afternoon, Mayor Gallego and members of the council. Thank you for having me today. Good afternoon, Mayor Gallego and members of the council. Happy Hispanic Heritage Month. We've been on quite a journey with the establishment of the Phoenix Latino Cultural Center. It has been 19 years, and I would like to share where we have been with this project over that time. Uh, it originated in 2001 when the city bond funding was given to an organization called Museo Chicano to expand space at 147 West Adams Street. In 2005, the Office of Arts and Culture provided Museo Chicano with a consultant to help with capacity building uh, to be good stewards of uh, bond funds. Unfortunately, Museo Chicano closed in 2008, but the bond money was held in a reserve for a future Hispanic Latino capital project by the city of Phoenix. In 2009, Arizona Latino Arts and Culture, ALAC, took over the lease at 147 West Adams, but not the bond funds. In 2016, the Office of Arts and Culture hired Yvonne Gallardo to conduct an environmental analysis with the community for a new Latino cultural center. In 2017, the report from that analysis was completed with community recommendations to move the project forward. In 2019, the ad hoc committee started their work in April and sunset in June of 2020, which leads us today of presenting the final recommendations to you. Again, we are so grateful of their time, dedication, and work on this project, and many committee members are watching today. 
The ad hoc committee met regularly and in addition had three working subcommittees. All meetings were open to the public and community members could participate in any of the three subcommittees including programs and services, site and operations, and fundraising and partnership. The ad hoc committee had two charges when established. Develop a strategic plan for the Latino Cultural Center which will lead and result in business programming and partnership and fundraising strategies. And two, consider options for citing the center based on the 2017 Capital Needs Assessment and Feasibility Study recommendations. The Capital Needs Assessment and Feasibility Study, sometimes referred to as the study, comes up a lot during the ad hoc committee's work. The study centered around extensive committee, community input which consisted of 23 one-on-one -on -one interviews, site visits to arts organizations and facilities in Phoenix and surrounding areas, three public town halls and two focus groups that engaged over 150 participants and an electronic survey with 254 respondents. What we learned from the study was there is obviously a rapid growth of the Latino population in Maricopa County. Administrative gaps for artists and Latino art and culture organizations in Phoenix challenging success, success and sustainability and residents expressed a need for an inclusive space that can bridge the many diverse streams of the Latino experience in Phoenix for residents and visitors. As for the center itself, the study highlights the, in the qualities, programming, location, facility, and business model needs. The center should be inclusive and accessible to all residents of Phoenix, multidisciplinary and programming for all ages, an administrative conduit for existing Latino arts and culture artists and organizations and programming should include festivals, classes, exhibitions, performances, and artist-led events. There wasn't a specific site identified in the study. However, there was a desire for a visible Latino cultural presence in Phoenix at the heart of the city's cultural core. The Latino Cultural Center should be on par and in company with Phoenix's other major cultural institutions and art centers downtown. It should be accessible from all areas and be along the light rail and public transportation routes. The study highlighted that the facility should be 22,000 plus or minus square feet of interior space for performances, classes, exhibitions, and offices. 18,000 plus or minus square feet of programmable outdoor space for festivals and events and ample parking for visitors. The report shared that the city should consider new construction on the city on city operated land rehab of an existing city operating building or mixed use development in partnership with city or private development. Research was done on other communities cultural centers including Albuquerque, Chicago, Dallas, Denver, and San Jose to discover program operational and fundraising comparisons. Ultimately, the National Hispanic Cultural Center in Albuquerque, New Mexico and the Latino Cultural Center in Dallas, Texas were visited. Ad hoc committee members leadership and staff met with authorizers and staff from these two institutions because they were both government funded and managed. The National Hispanic Cultural Center was a 22 acre compound that opened in 2000 and had a capital project budget of $56 million that was raised through public and private ventures. Its annual budget from the state of New Mexico is $2.8 million for its staff, programs and services. The Latino Cultural Center in Dallas is more of the scale discussed in the 2017 study. It opened in 2003, is 27,000 square feet, cost $9.8 million to build, and is city run with a nonprofit friends group contributing revenue on an annual basis. Its annual budget from the city of Dallas is $600,000 for staffing, programs, and services. For our own site research, the city's planning and development and community and economic development departments provided city operated properties in and out of the traditional downtown boundaries for the ad hoc committee to review. What was learned is the sites out of downtown code require more land for the center that would be a minimum of four contiguous acres outside of downtown. Sites in downtown are more compact and urban and can allow for smaller land lots with taller buildings. Four sites were ultimately reviewed in depth in the central city that kept to the 2017 study and were a mix of empty lots for new build, a pre-existing facility for rehabilitation, and a potential mixed-use partnership. Sites included the empty parcel next to the Herberger Theater grounds, the North Building at Hans Park, the empty lot next to the Phoenix Public Market, and the site of the Regency Garage that was up for an RFP. Gensler Architects did pro bono work in the summer of 2019 to show how massing could work for each location. 
Through the work with Gensler, the committee learned the cost of construction would be between eight and $15 million. There is currently less than $1 million in bond funds available to kick off the project. In the middle of planning, the ad hoc committee felt that the what was needed to start financial planning, including determining the location and actual construction costs. The ad hoc committee felt knowing a site location could start putting the pieces together of a capital campaign to raise funds needed for the project. With that, three recommendations were already brought to City Council, including on December 14th, 2019, approving utilizing the North Building at Hans Park for the Latino Cultural Center while still evaluating additional sites for consideration and hiring a capital campaign consultant to assist in the financial planning of the new center. On March 4th, 2020, Council approved opening a designated fund at the Arizona Community Foundation to accept gifts from donors of any size who want to make a tax deductible donation to support the new center. Where are we now with these? The RFP for the capital campaign consultant was finalized at the start of the pandemic, but put on hold, but is ready to go out to bid. We are in the process of opening the fund at the Arizona Community Foundation, and Gensler Architects did a formalized building assessment of the North Building, and we are working with Community and Economic Development and the Finance Department's Real Estate Division on reviewing other potential sites for consideration. The report includes all recommendations by the ad hoc, including these additional recommendations for your discussion and approval of today. The Latino Cultural Center should be run by the City of Phoenix for its first five years of operations, with a nonprofit or collective eventually taking over the administration of the center. The Phoenix Office of Arts and Culture should coordinate pop-up programs at libraries, community centers, cultural events, and virtually to promote the Latino Cultural Center before it opens. And three, set up a Friends of Latino Cultural Center 501c3 nonprofit and recruit inaugural board members for fundraising and getting the word out for the center. Based on the information presented and on behalf of the Latino Cultural Center Ad Hoc Committee, staff requests that the City Council approve the report and additional recommendations. Thank you. It's been a pleasure to serve on this committee and I know the community is excited about this project. We're happy to take any questions at this time. Well, thank you to our staff and the committee for their wonderful work. Councilman Nowakowski. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Mayor, first of all, I'd like to make a motion to approve staff's recommendation for a Latino Cultural Center. And at the same time, I'm not sure if there's a second or not. Second. And at the same time, I really like to thank all the individuals that participated um, back four years ago. And just really, we brought in a consultant. That consultant came in. It had brainstorming ideas. We met in the west side, south side, and central Phoenix. And it was just wonderful to see all the different artists come together with a dream. And now this dream is coming to reality. So I just want to really thank all the different artists, all the different dance groups, all the mariachis and, and bailets that were involved in this process, and also my colleagues for the support and, and caring about the Latino community. And this is going to be a jewel of the city of Phoenix, and I believe it's going to be a destination point uh, for for the center of Phoenix also. So thank you once again, Mitch. Thank you to the ad hoc committee for making this all possible, and thank you, um, Thelda and Kate, for making this all come through. Thank you, Councilman, for your longtime leadership. I will go to your co-chair, the vice mayor, and then Councilwoman Williams. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah, me as well. I want to thank the ad hoc committee. I know there were a lot of different type of discussions, a lot of different, different diverse um, backgrounds. But I think at the end of the day, I'm very thankful for everyone wanting, wanting to have a Latino cultural center. Want to want to thank Mitch also for all of his work. I know we, I know Mitch, we give you tons of headaches um, in this process, but we're very excited um, to be here to be here today and to be able to approve this. I I know that it took a, a lot of work to get to this point um, and I'm looking forward um, to continuing this project in the future and hopefully um, in a very, in the very short term, we will have a Latino Cultural Center in Phoenix. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Thank you for your hard work on this and the woman who got this committee started, Councilwoman Williams. Thank you, Mayor. I want to thank everybody that's on that ad hoc committee and the leadership. It's very impressive. For years, they wallowed this around, and one decision 
and then they change it the next few months. And I'm so glad to see that we had leaders that stepped forth and went to it and got totally involved. And we now have an absolute great plan, something the city of Phoenix can be proud of, something which generations can enjoy. So thank you all for participating for your leadership. And I will promise to try to help raise some money for it. So thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor? Mayor? Councilman DeCicio. Oh, thank you, Mayor. I just want to congratulate city staff, but mostly to Councilman Nowakowski. This, this has been a dream of his. I mean, he's talked to me about it for how long, Michael? <laughs> how many years? So um, I just think this is fantastic. Uh, you've been able to get this thing done, move it forward, and for all those that worked on it, I know there were other on the council, but I do remember years ago, uh, Michael bringing this up to me and I thought, eh, I don't, see, I don't know if any of this will ever get done, but it's glad we're taking this step here. Congratulations to all of you that worked on this. Thank you, Sal. Mayor. Uh, thank you, Councilman DeCicio, Councilwoman Stark. Uh, yes, Mayor, I just wanted to echo what uh, Councilman DeCicio said. Uh, Michael, you have worked on this long and hard. I remember when I was planning director and you would talk about this. So I'm really impressed to see it moving forward and I think you should get most of the credit. I know other people helped, but I know it was your dream. So kudos to you. Thank you, Councilman Stark. Councilmember Garcia. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, definitely. Thank you to everyone who brought us this far. I think um, Councilman Alkowski, it, it it was a dream. It was brought forward. I think it's it's you know some of us get to take it from here, um, on, and we'll make sure to to remember all the work that was done to get here. I still think we have a lot of work to do, and and we need to make sure that because of all the years that it took that we get something that's amazing, whether it's at North Ends Park or we're able to find somewhere else to do a, a build up from, from scratch to make sure that we get what we deserve with the Latino population being what it is in the city of Phoenix at 44%. I think we deserve a great cultural center. Um, the Latino community, the Chicano community has played a huge role in, in the building of this city and, and we look forward and, and thank the committee and thank staff and, and thank you, Michael and, and, the, and vice mayor for making this happen. Um, so I'm excited to, to roll up our sleeves, start fundraising and, and, and get this done. So thank you all so much for the work. Any final comments? All right, I think then we are ready for a roll call vote. All right. Councilman DeCicio? Yes. Councilmember Garcia? Yes. Councilman Nowakowski? Si. <laughs> Councilwoman <laughs> Pastor? Yes. Councilwoman Stark? Yes. Councilman Waring? Yes. Councilwoman Williams? Yes. Vice Mayor Guardado? Yes. And Mayor Gallego? Yes. And Mayor, that motion passes unanimously. Wonderful, congratulations to all involved, including our entire city. That is our final agendized item for today's policy meeting. So we are adjourned. Stay safe and enjoy that fall weather. <laughs>